But this is like a, in the internet, right? That when we teach a course on something, like in my case with evolutionary algorithms, I teach a course. I have been teaching this course for a long time. We, we receive emails from people from different parts of the world asking questions. Some questions are reasonable, like uh, do you have a reference on the use of genetic algorithms in this problem and so forth. But other guys, the question is clearly a transcription of a homework. You know, like, do you have an implementation of a genetic algorithm that can solve this specific problem with these ranges of the decision variable? <laughs> so, yeah, I, know, I normally reply, yes, I have it, but I'm not going to give it to you. It's a homework. It's clearly a homework. Yeah. So it's very funny. This time, these days, I I don't reply most of those messages, but I get sometimes some weird, weird messages. Okay. So if you want to know more about multi-objective taboo search, there is a paper from uh, Parks, 2008, and also in my book. We move now to uncolony optimization. Uncolony optimization is a meta heuristic proposed at the beginning of the 90s by this guy, Marco Dorigo, in, in Italy. He was proposing his PhD thesis. And he's based on the behavior of real ants. Uh, his, ba his work was based on the behavior of Argentinian ants. I really don't know why they were Argentinian ants, but that, that's what he says in his original paper. So in nature, ants have a very interesting behavior they deposit a chemical substance called pheromone. And this substance influences the behavior of the ants. So ants will tend to create paths in, area con in areas that contain a large amount of pheromone. Uh, the pheromone normally uh, is a substance that they can smell very well because the ants will have uh, the equivalent of seven noses. And we only have one nose. These guys, they have the equivalent of seven. So they are very good at the smelling. They can perceive this. And in recent years, you know, humans, we always do weird things. Some people have elaborated this theory that pheromones are good for attracting uh, women. So they sell these perfumes that contain pheromone. I don't know what that means. Uh, you are going to get ants, lots of them. but. Uh, Pheromone paths can be seen as an indirect communication mechanism. So this is actually a real behavior of ants, and it's very interesting. When, when they, uh, they start, the ants are in, in the nest, and they come out looking for food. So this is the nest. You have a hole, and you have the ants coming out. And there is some source of food somewhere. So biologists have found out that what ants do is once one of them finds food, they walk back to the nest. And in this path they follow from, from the food to the nest, they segregate this substance called pheromone. So for example, ant number one takes this path. Then ant number two follows this path. Ant number three follows this path, and so on. What happens is very interesting. Over time, all these paths merge together into a single one. And this single path turns out to be the shortest distance between the foot and the nest. So this is called, by uh, biologists call it this way, also sociologists, a swarm behavior. Because intelligence is collective. It's not individual. This path was not created by any individual ant. It's really the outcome of combining the paths of all the ants. Bees behave in a similar way. So there are some insects that have this swarm behavior. Some sociologists have elaborated the theory that human groups also tend to have swarm behavior under certain conditions. For example, when people are very angry, or when people are celebrating something, most of the people in a large group tend to follow the behavior of a few people. And, and you know, people go completely out of control. 
completely out of control because they are these guys in this big mass of people. These people taken in isolation is very likely they behave in a completely different way. And of course, they will deny everything they did in this one. But uh, when seen as a group, this collective intelligence is really a collective behavior. So this is a very interesting phenomenon. So Marco Dorigo, in the early 90s, he, he posed the question, will it be possible to simulate this in a computer? Yes. Sir, uh, does some intelligence related to some part of machine learning? Well, uh, according to Marco Dorigo, and colon optimization, other people say particle swarm, all these algorithms, uh, the uh, DPs algorithms, are supposed to simulate the swarm uh, behaviors and therefore produce swarm learning. However, meta heuristics in general, they don't learn. <coughs> they just move according to some information they, they got. Learning implies storing the information and improving this information over time. So meta heuristics in general don't do that. So I will say more swarm behavior rather than swarm learning. I mean, it's, it's a more controversial term in this, in this context. But uh, Ancolon is, of course, not the only algorithm that, that has this one. So this is very interesting. Ants also do many other interesting things. Uh, some years ago, I, I had uh, this master's student who had read a paper in Nature of some uh, experiments some biologists did. And biologists, they do weird experiments. Uh, some guy figured out that he, he posed this hypothesis that the ants had some device, this is a biological device located in their legs that allows them to estimate how close they are from the nest. And they said, this guy is crazy, right? So he, uh, he said this device, this was located there, and it worked like some sort of sonar that could emit some ultra frequency, or whatever, and this will allow the ants to orient themselves with respect to the other ants and with respect to, to some object. Could be the nest, could be food, anything else. So they say, okay, we're gonna uh, validate or refute this hypothesis. So what the guy did, he put this uh, small uh, things on the on the legs of some ants, something like putting them shoes, so that the ants could not touch the ground. So he said, if they use something related, you know, they have a lot of hair in their ants, the, the, uh, in their legs, related to this uh, small hair they have in the, in the in their feet. If the device is in there, by elevating the feet, so that they cannot touch the ground the device will not work properly. And it turns out the guy was right. By adding these things, these small, uh, uh, you can call them shoes, to, uh, to the ants, the ants could not touch the ground and they got disoriented. So it's very interesting. There are still many things we don't know exactly about how ants behave and, and many other insects. And, and we simulated this in a, in the computer, and, and we were able to develop a variation of the ant colony optimization that, that had a better performance based on simulating this device. But I won't tell you the, the details of that. We, we did that a long time ago. So from a computer science perspective, an ant colony is really a multi-agent system in which we have low-level interactions among the individual agents. The individual agents are, are of course, the ants. And this produces a complex emergent behavior. This is the most interesting part. This behavior, as I said before, is not produced by any single individual. It's, it's the, uh, the collective behavior. This is the outcome of, of, of the algorithm. So this is a swarm algorithm, uh, or they are also called emerging behavior techniques. And they have become very fashionable in, in, in recent years, not only from the computer science perspective, but also from the sociological or psychological perspective. Many people are interested in studying this. So the core ideas from the colonies of real lands that have been adopted in, in, in ant colony optimization are the following. The indirect communication of the ants through their pheromone trails, the shortest paths tend to have a higher growth 
rate of pheromone. Ants tend to give a higher preference with a certain probability, of course, to those paths having a higher amount of pheromone. All this is modeled in, in, in the metaheuristic. But additionally, there are other features that are in the simulation that we don't know if they exist in real ants. For example, each ant is able to estimate how far is from a certain state. As I told you before, now we know that this is true. But at the time this algorithm was implemented, we didn't know if ants could actually estimate how far they were from a state. Ants have information about the environment and use it to make decisions. So the behavior is not only adapted, but it's also comprehensive. Ants have memory because we require this memory to ensure that only feasible solutions are generated at each step of the algorithm. So it's, it's, it's a very interesting algorithm. Some people had worked on this idea before. Marco Dorigo was actually not the first guy who, who came up with this idea. Uh, there were other, other Italians involved. And then Marco worked with this guy, Gambardella, who proposed uh, an algorithm called ANQ. ANQ is a hybrid, we can see it that way, that combines something called Q learning with the ANT system. The ANT system was the very first version of the ANT colony optimization. Uh, I'm not going to get into all the details on how this works, but Q learning is basically what we call reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is a very nice name for an algorithm that is pretty much uh, a greedy algorithm, a brute force approach. It's very popular in robotics and in some uh, machine learning uh, areas. Many people use reinforcement learning. And, uh, and basically, in ANQ, they still use several agents. They use the, uh, the, the ANTs. They use a heuristic that depends on the domain. This depends on the particular problem that you are solving. This heuristic will tell me how good is an action with respect to others, and also uses a rule to select actions that consider the previously uh, indicated heuristic function and the evaluation function of a pair of a state action uh, uh, in, in, the, in the system. So it uses an expression like this. Q is a, is a random value that uh, is chosen in, in the range 0 to 1. And Q0 is a constant. So, in this algorithm, Q0 must be selected in such a way that a larger Q0 implies a lower probability of random selecting a solution. Uh, in here, uh, capital S is a, is a state that is randomly selected based on a probability function. So you can see that in this algorithm, the movements are given by a probability function. So it's not a deterministic algorithm. It's probabilistic. Same as, uh, as simulate and So this is the ANQ algorithm. And the main uh, part is this equation that is repeated twice. The rest, it looks pretty much like any other population-based metaheuristic. We generate randomly an initial population. But the important part is here because Q is used to evaluate uh, solutions. Something interesting of this algorithm is that we have these alpha and gamma parameters, which are, uh, are called the learning step and the discount factor. These components are actually taken from the Q learning algorithm. So uh, Mariano and Morales in 99, they proposed a, a multi-objective extension of ANQ. It was called multi-objective ANQ. And this algorithm uses a family of agents to solve a multi-objective problem. They solve a, an engineering problem. But uh, it doesn't really use Pareto dominance. It uses lexicographic ordering because the objectives have to be sorted, sorted according to the preferences of the user. And, and the problem is solved in an incremental way. It, Pareto dominance is only used for the external archive. Uh, this is the... Uh, the main algorithm, and, and, and this is the paper. It was presented at Gecko 99. Iredi proposed an, an ant colony optimization uh, algorithm that uses uh, several populations. And in this case, the most interesting part is that he uses heterogeneous colonies of ants. That means the, uh, the weights of an aggregating function 
are different for each population. Then he has a cooperative mechanism based on the exchange of solutions among these different uh, colonies or populations. So he, in his experiments, he considers two populations, and each population has its own pheromone matrix. One population is given for each objective. That is basically what, what they do. It, it, it's similar to the Pareto archive uh, because he, uh, he segments the Pareto front similar to the use of the adapted grid. Uh, and this is, uh, is meant to enhance diversity. Uh, Christian Gagné, he proposed an approach in which the heuristic values used to decide the movements of an ant take into consideration the existence of several objectives. However, when they update the pheromone trails, they consider only one objective at a time. So again, they require the user to indicate the most important objective. Again, this is lexicographic order so that uh, he, they can ensure that the agents will converge toward the solutions that primarily satisfy the most preferred objective and the trade-offs among all the other objectives are only uh, considered with a lower priority. So this, uh, this sort of uh, algorithm will be more appropriate for problems in which objectives are given a priority, that we don't consider all the objectives to be equally important, but there is one that is very important, and then the others, if I, if I improve them, it's okay, but they are less important than the main one. So they apply this to a task scheduling problem with a single machine. And Gravel, these are also people from Canada, they, they use the same approach for another problem, an industrial scheduling problem in which only one constraint is considered, and they handle the constraint using a penalty function. McMullen, he used a, a, a non-colony optimizer to, to solve sequencing problems. You can see all these problems are, are really combinatorial. And colony optimization is mostly used for combinatorial optimization. There are few attempts to use them, to use this algorithm in continuous optimization. This we will see at the end of this topic. So the problem is transformed to special data such that uh, TSP approach can be used to, uh, to find production sequences with uh, configuration levels and rates that are desirable for the decision maker. And they analyze different types of approaches. Each of them offers a, a specific strategy to find desirable uh, sequences. For example, some strategies focus only on optimizing a single objective. Others try to optimize the two objectives at the same time, and, and so on. When the two objectives are considered, they, they are separately optimized. During the first 50% of the sequence, the first objective is preferred, and the other 50%, the second objective is preferred. So again, they use lexicographic order. Something that I forgot to mention is that the original algorithm, the ANT system, because as I say today, it's called uh, ACO, and colony optimization, but the original algorithm, was specifically designed for the traveling salesman problem. So any problem you wanted to solve, you had to state the problem as an instance of the traveling salesman. So that was a constraint of the original algorithm. This is no longer required because now the algorithm is more general. But for those of you interested in, in the traveling salesman, this is an algorithm that at the very beginning was designed only for that problem. The king, he, well, this guy has an interesting book on multi-criteria scheduling. He, he proposed an approach called SACO that uses an colon optimization for uh, solving a bicriterion flow shop scheduling problem. Again, he uses uh, lexicographic ordering. But in this case, he uses local search. So this could be seen as a, as a memetic algorithm. The uh, local search is applied during a certain fixed number of iterations. But he admits it's, it's very expensive to use this approach. Something interesting is that in this paper, they consider that diversification is preferred at the beginning of the search, and intensification is preferred towards the end. This is similar as we do it with evolutionary algorithms. At the beginning, we mutate at a very high rate because we want to explore, and towards the end, we intensify the search be, uh, and reduce the mutation rate because we want to converge. So for achieving this, they use a, a variable selection probability based on, on simulated annealing. 
Chelokar, he proposed a multi-objective approach based also on ant colony. Uh, and this is an interesting one because he applies this to combinatorial and continuous optimization problems. What he does is, is really an ant-based version of SPEA, uh, Sitzler's algorithm. Uh, he uses most of the algorithms from the strength Pareto evolutionary algorithm, fitness assignment, the external archive, clustering, all this is, is used. But the search engine is, is a non-colony optimization algorithm. This is a hybrid because he also incorporates crossover and, and mutation and a local uh, search mechanism. He also uses these uh, so-called thermodynamic uh, clusters. Uh, Benjamin Baran, he extended uh, a, an algorithm proposed by Gambardella called the Multiple Land Colony System for Vehicle Routing Problems with Time Windows, such that uh, all the objectives share the same pheromone trails, and the knowledge of the good solutions is equally important for each objective function. Gambardella's approach uses a linear aggregating function. So he has a list containing the non-dominant solutions, and each new non-dominant solution is compared with respect to the contents of this list. Something interesting of this approach is that the pheromone trail is reinitialized at the end of each generation using the, uh, the average values of the Pareto optimal set. So this is something unusual in, in, in ant colony. There are many other proposals. For example, Cardoso proposed this Monaco, that uh, this was used for uh, searching in a graph. Uh, Derner used uh, this PACO that uses a quad tree. And uh, the pheromone updates are, are done using two ants, the best and the second best values generated in the, in the current generation for each objective. You can see that most of these have been used for a single objective optimizers. Parito dominance sometimes is used in the external archive, but in the main search engine, most of these proposals are single objective. Monaco was used for network optimization. This was a PhD thesis of a guy in Spain. Gunch and Middendorf, they proposed another PACO without the dash. In this case, the population is formed with a subset of the non-dominant solutions found so far. So first, one solution is randomly selected, but the rest are chosen so that they are closest to this initial solution using some distance uh, measure. Then they use this method. This is a very old ranking technique called the average rank weight method to construct uh, a selection probability. This is basically a non-linear aggregating function. So they transform the, uh, the vector problem into a scalar problem. And with this probability distribution, they, they select which is the, uh, the direction in which the ants are going to move. Uh, Derner, Carl Derner, in another paper, they proposed this competence, which was designed for a bi-objective optimization problem, consists of two ant populations with different priority rules. The first of these colonies uses uh, priority rules that emphasizes one of the objectives, and the second one emphasizes the other objective. So the idea is to combine the best solutions of the two populations to find good trade-offs. So this is pretty much like Vega, right? It's the same idea of Vega, of uh, optimizing separately the objectives and then trying to combine them. For continuous search spaces, as I said, it's not very common to, uh, to find papers that deal with uh, extensions of ant colony for continuous search spaces, but some people have worked in this area. For example, Guillermo. Guillermo Leguizamón, he was my PhD thesis. He's uh, from Argentina. Uh, we only know two approaches in which a multi-objective version of ant colony optimization has been used in continuous search space. We have this, the population-based ACO algorithm for multi-objective function optimization and the multi-objective ant colony optimizer. The first is based in this uh, ACOR, this is a, an extension that was proposed by a Polish guy together with Marco Dorigo. Uh, basically, for continuous problems, they discretize the search space so that uh, ACO can deal, can deal with these problems. So they use this version 
And the crowding population-based ACO, this is an algorithm that this guy proposed, Angus. This was actually his PhD thesis in Australia. And uh, the pheromone model is similar to that of, of ACOR. And they use a replacement operator based on the crowding distance to maintain diversity in the population and fitness shares for a uniform sampling of the objective space. And this is the, uh, this is the paper. Uh, Abel Garcia Najera, he proposed an extension of the same algorithm, uh, this ACOR, for solving multi-objective optimization problems. This is actually not a very good algorithm. The performance is not very good. And uh, so the idea here is to, uh, to choose which solutions should be stored in the pheromone archive. So in, uh, in ACOR, after each iteration, the best newly created solutions according to the objective function values, are kept in the archive. This is very easy to do because it's single objective, right? So you evaluate the objective function value. So how do you do this in, in, a, in the multi-objective case? They use this concept of dominant, dominance depth in, in order to preserve at each iteration those solutions closer to the Pareto front. However, since the pheromone archive has a fixed size, it's bounded, then if the number of solutions exceeds this size, they have to use a density mechanism based on, on, on crowding distance so that they remove, they, they prune the contents of, of, the, of the archive. So the solutions with a higher value are removed and they, are, uh, and they keep the archive size below some, some maximal size. So the other mechanisms are exactly the same as the original ACOR algorithm. More recently, uh, Guillermo, who is now my PhD student, he, he just started a year ago the, uh, the PhD. In his master's, he, he developed this algorithm, uh, which is the first multi-objective multi and colony optimizer, which is designed for uh, many objective optimization, for problems having four or more objectives. It's also based on, on ACOR, and it's based on the performance indicator R2 that we saw yesterday. So it is based on decomposition. And he uses the R2 ranking algorithm. This, this algorithm was proposed by another PhD student of mine in an algorithm called Mombi, based on R2. So he uses this uh, R2 ranking algorithm. And the non-dominant solutions obtained by the algorithm are stored in a pheromone archive based on their objective function values. And the best solutions in terms of rank are used to generate new solutions. This we published uh, last year in the journal Swarm Intelligence. This is a journal that was created by Marco Dorigo. He, and he is the, uh, the editor-in-chief of the journal. So applications, you can see there are quite a few applications of uh, multi-objective and colony optimizers. Most of these applications are in combinatorial optimization. So we have a scheduling, uh, placement of switches in distribution networks, power plants maintenance schedule, scheduling, virtual machine placement in cloud computing, scheduling continuous casting of aluminum, and so forth. Most of these are, are combinatorial. So uncoloring has been also a very, very popular algorithm. If you want to know more, there is an interesting paper published in 2007 in the European Journal of Operational Research this presents uh, as half of the paper is a survey, and the other half is an experimental study in which they test several multiple objective and colony optimizers in the by criteria traveling salesman problem. And they analyze them, their performance, and, and they make some, some, they provide some guidelines regarding uh, the use of multi objective and colony optimizers. And then more recently, in 2011, with Guillermo, we published a survey, a survey on multi-objective and colony optimization in, in a book. OK, we move to the, uh, to the next. At, at any point, if you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, I'm assuming you have all the slides, right? You have all the, uh, the PDFs, right? <laughs> but if you miss something, let me know. I can go back in case you, you need some, some information. Oh, no, the tutorials I didn't provide. No, only the, uh, 
only this. But if you want the tutorials, I can send it to you. What happened was that it was kind of interesting that uh, a few, like two, three weeks ago, I was very happy because I had finished all my lectures. I actually was using pretty much the same lecture I gave in Patna, but I extended uh, some, some uh, topics. And I added uh, memetic algorithms, which was not in the, uh, in the other presentation. But then I was asked to design assignments and a project for you guys. And I said, are you sure you want me to give them assignments? Because this is only five days, right? And, and plus assignments, a project on top of that. And well, you know, in Mexico we say, you have to give the customer whatever he wants, right? So, <laughs> If that's what you want, it's fine with me. You know, I can do it. But uh, I warn them that probably many of you will not survive <laughs> with the assignments. <laughs> and, but you know, if that's what they are asking, it's fine with me. So these tutorials are, are really, oh God. It's the second time it does the same thing. You probably have an illegal version of Windows, right? It's, that's why it's crashing all the time. So what happened is the tutorials, the first part is a few slides summarizing what we saw. But the second part that I didn't show you are the assignments. <laughs> so that's why I didn't provide that, because you were not supposed to know what the assignments were, right? <laughs> But yeah, I, I can remove that part and, and give it to you if, if you are interested. But it's just a summary. In general, it's, it's, it's a summary of, of what we already saw. But if you are interested, I, I have no problem in providing those. There will be uh, another lecture that also is not included. It's not really a lecture. It's, it's just uh, a short presentation that I mentioned the first day. Uh, for tomorrow, I will give it at the very end which is on some uh, tips for publishing, publishing your work in a specialized journals. That's, uh, I will give you some, some guidelines. Yes. So it's the last system you would work in publishing this. It is publishing. The only one from those that we have seen so far that is not publishing based is simulated. All the others are published. Simulated you can also add a Yes, the original algorithm is not the Okay, so the next one is one algorithm that many of you already know. You don't know why to use it, but you know the algorithm, which is good, <laughs> because some people were asking me, why should I use it? You sound like a reviewer. You are asking me like reviewers ask. Why do you use PSO? You know, uh, when I was in a uh, long time ago, back in 98, you guys were in Kirden Kindergarten, or, or probably not even there. Uh, I was in England working in, uh, there were these uh, engineering design centers. They created several in UK, and I was in Plymouth in the south of England. And uh, a, a friend of mine told me this story that he claims is true. There was a guy who came to this place to get his PhD in, uh, it was called natural computation. So they, they had people who work in neural networks and people who work on, on meta heuristics. I, I was with the meta heuristic guys. So basically, this center had contracts with companies and with the government on, on real world projects. And the uh, PhD thesis were designed around these projects. So basically, a student who entered the PhD there, he was given a real world problem and he was asked to solve the problem. And once he solved the problem, he could graduate. Normally that will happen in about three years because that was the time that the company will sponsor the scholarship of this guy. And, uh, and of course you need to have some intuition and, and, and to get some in-depth knowledge very quickly about the meta heuristic and about the problem itself. So when I was working there, we were solving some problems for aeronautical industry and for other, for other companies. Then I abandoned the real world. I went to academia. I'm not interested in the real world anymore. Real world is when I get home. But, uh, in my office is, is the artificial world, right? The academic world, we, we don't solve real problems. We, solve, we only design algorithms and other people use those algorithms to solve those problems. But they told me the story of this guy. He, he entered this group for the PhD and he was given a specific problem to solve 
And of course, he had absolutely no clue on how to solve it. And, and the British are not very good, some of them, for guiding students. They, they allow the student to iterate towards infinity until either the student finds out or he gives up, whatever happens first. <laughs> and, and this guy started iterating, started reading a lot. Because you see, one problem, uh, I had a, a professor who used to tell this, and this is absolutely true. Sometimes it's better not to know anything than to know little about something. Or that whatever you know, you don't know well. Or you don't understand. You have it in your memory, it's just you don't really understand what you have in your memory. The knowledge, and this is a strange that I say this, being a scientist, but knowledge sometimes is dangerous. So these guys started to read a lot about genetic algorithms. And what happens is the more he read, the more confused he got. Because there are so many types of genetic algorithms. You know? This sort, this other sort. At that time, we had the hierarchical genetic algorithm, the messy genetic algorithm, the, uh, the structure genetic algorithm. And he almost went crazy. And of course, at some point, he only had one question. Which of these you know, 11,000 genetic algorithms should I use? And of course, his advisor was of no use for that, but because he told him, that's your job. You are the one who has to decide. So he went to a conference in the US, uh, uh, this ICGA, which is now GECO. It's the top conference in genetic algorithms. At that time, that conference was held every two years. It was very difficult to get a paper accepted or to become a member of the program committee and so on. It was a very uh, prestigious conference. And in the conference, he met the man. David Gold. David Goldberg at that time, he was God in genetic algorithms, the guy who knew everything about genetic algorithms. So he approached Goldberg and asked him. You know, he said, I have this problem, blah, blah, blah. Goldberg didn't pay any attention to what he was saying. And then he said, what do you suggest me to use? What sort of genetic algorithm do you suggest me to use? And at that time, Goldberg was obsessed with the messy genetic algorithm, which is meant for deceptive problems. This problem, he didn't know if it was deceptive or not. Not that he cared either. Nobody was using the messy genetic algorithm. So the guy thought, OK, you know, Goldberg, who is, you know, God in genetic algorithms, he told me to use the messy GA. So came back to England, implemented the, well, there was some code available of the messy GA, tried this in his problem, it worked. So far, so good. So he chose up for his PhD thesis defense which in England is a nightmare. You know, I, I got my PhD from the US, but I had the opportunity to be in some, in some committee in, in England. And this thing is, is like a nightmare, you know, a PhD defense. When you start a PhD defense with a thesis that has 200, 250 pages, and the first reader has a post-it in the abstract of the thesis with the first question, and then you realize almost every page has a post-it. I was doing the math. You know, this thing is going to take like six hours. Just this guy. You know, and there are like five other guys. So this is going to last the whole day. I should bring lunch to this thing. So these, these defenses are a serious thing in, in England. The supervisor doesn't worry about the student, but in the defense, you know, they eat you alive. So the guy shows up to the defense. And of course, the first question was, why did you use a messy genetic algorithm? That's the obvious question. And the guy, you know, he was very honest. He said, because David Goldmer told me. <laughs> this is not, I can tell you, this is not a very good answer in a PhD exam. So don't quote me. Don't say, oh, Carlos Cuello told me to use this. Don't say that because you're going to flunk the exam. So don't do that. It's OK, you know, it's our secret. I can tell you, yeah, yeah. But sometimes, you know, you are telling me things, and, and they are going, they enter in one ear, come out from the other. I'm not retaining anything. My brain is thinking, I'm thinking, this book that I was reading in the morning, this paper, sometimes I'm not paying that much attention. So don't, don't take what I tell you, you know, as, as a law, life. It's not like that. You, you have to find out yourselves, and to justify yourself, this is more important. Sometimes it's not that important what you use. The algorithm may be irrelevant. What is important is how you defend what you use. 
And some people are really good at defending. They use some really crappy arguments. He works out on that. But when you read the justification, this is a point. You want to cry when you read the song. This is awesome. <laughs> I didn't know the argument was so good. <laughs> it's not that good. It's that it was really good at you know, bullshitting and writing all these things. Well, it can be very convincing. So that's what really matters. Because then you review and say, okay, this guy tried everything, and he finally found that this was the best. Not only that, it's not the case. They use a particular argument because they read a paper on that, because somebody told them, this somebody may be anybody. Sometimes the guy sitting next to him. <laughs> <laughs> this guy knows even less about arguments. But this guy, what did he do? Which is probably the argument this guy wanted to use, but his advisor didn't allow him to use it. He said, no, this guy can do it. I was not allowed to do it. This guy can do it. His advisor won't say anything. So don't throw those people. You are the ones who have to defend whatever you need to do. Nobody else. Nobody will do it for you. And, and, and your advisor may buy probably anything you say. But this is a committee that's a different system. They, they may think all of this. So be careful with this. So PSO is, is a very famous algorithm. It's actually a very interesting algorithm. It was proposed by these two guys. It's, a, it's an interesting combination. This guy, Jim Kennedy, is a sociologist. And Ross Everhart is a computer scientist. So it's, it's very weird, right? This combination is very strange. So the story goes that back in 95, they were working on a, in an optimization problem that is not that difficult. They were trying to synchronize traffic lights. And they were using a genetic algorithm for that problem. I really have no idea of why they were working together. Uh, this, I have no clue. And what happened was the genetic algorithm they had was not working, was simply not working. So they started to think we, we should design something else, a different kind of approach. So they came up with the idea of this very simple algorithm that they call particle swarm. And they say this is inspired by the choreography of a bird flog and whatever. You know. These things are normally not true. Uh, in evolutionary computation, one of the things, if you work in this area, one thing you will find out, and this is very strange, I, I really have no explanation of why this happens, but it happens, is that hardcore evolutionary computation people, they really love when you make a proposal that has a biological foundation. And this, you can fake it completely. You can say, I read in this paper the behavior of the bees or whatever. Whatever you want to say is fine. Nobody will care to check this. Now, be careful because from time to time, some of these guys, they know biology. And they will know that you are lying. But in general, if you propose something with a biological inspiration eh, and it works, everybody goes crazy. So, oh, this is awesome. You know, this is wonderful, a wonderful proposal. I believe they designed the algorithm first, and then the biological inspiration came later. But that's OK. You know, nobody really cares. So it worked. And then they said, we have to write a paper, because they had been, I think Ross had been invited to a conference in Japan. And, and he wanted to present this brand new idea he had. So they wrote this paper saying, this can be seen as a distributed behavioral algorithm that performs multidimensional search, blah, 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 all, all the explanation. And over the years, they claimed this was part of swarm intelligence as well. And actually, there is a very interesting story that uh, the book they published, they eventually published a book in the year 2001, I believe, uh, called Swarm Intelligence. And, and there was a fight, a weird fight. These things are very common in evolutionary computation. I really don't know why. There is a famous fight between Goldberg and, and David Fogel. And here there was a fight between Dorigo and these guys. I really don't know why was the fight. But there are two books that have the same name, Swarm Intelligence. One is very famous, this one, from PSO. The other one on non-colony optimization is not that famous. One of those two books, in the preface, it says, this is really a book on swarm intelligence. Yeah. 
not like you know the other garbage that was published with the same title. Something like that. It's, it's, I, I'm not going to tell you which one says that, but one of the two books says it. So, and over the years, I think they had a difficult relationship, but now they are friends again. So this is the algorithm. The algorithm is, is very, very simple. It's, it's even uh, easier to follow than, than a genetic algorithm. This is, of course, for single objective. So we have a population. It's another population-based algorithm. P are the particles. These are not individuals, of course. They are particles. It's the same, right? It's particles. Population is not population. It's the swarm. Right? It's a different terminology. So you initialize the particles randomly, and each particle has a velocity associated with them. These velocities initially are set to zero. So this is how fast the particles will move. We are simulating the movement of particles in a fluid. It can be air, it can be water, whatever you want, any fluid. OK. So we initialize the personal best which is the best position that each particle has had during the search, we initialize this with the initial particles. At the beginning, the personal best is the initial solution because we haven't explored the space yet. So the main component is this formula, this mysterious formula for the velocity. So you can see that the new velocity depends on the previous velocity, on the personal best of the particle, and in something that they call the global best. The global best, the personal best, is the position that each particle had in the past. You know, in particle number five, what is the best from the 20 different positions I had, which is the best. But the global best is the best from the whole swarm. Right? That's the leader. That guy is the leader. So we have these two components, and then we have W. W is called the inertia weight. It's how, how much are we following in the same direction. Then we have C1 and C2. They are called the cognitive and the sociological uh, factors. Nobody really knew what that meant. And then R1 and R2, which are random numbers. So some people, you know, if you know some basic math, they will tell you things like, OK, if you have two random numbers here, why do you need the constants? Don't ask me, right? Go and ask these guys. They are the ones who design the equation. Uh, if you ask me, I don't think you need the C1 and C2, but they are there anyway. And then the population, if you see, consists of the position plus the velocity. So you see there is no mutation. You are just adding the velocity directly to the position. And then you update the best particle in the whole population and the best for each of them. That's all the other. It's very simple, very fast, of course, because there is no crossover, there is no mutation. So one question that some people ask is, is this an evolutionary algorithm? If you ask Ross Everhart, the, he will defend with his life that it is an evolutionary algorithm. Strictly speaking, it's not, because in an evolutionary algorithm, we need a fitness-based selection mechanism. And in here, you don't select solutions based on fitness. You select solutions based on the best in this one. The best on what? On the objective function value, which could be the fitness, of course, but there is no notion of fitness in this case. The algorithm has some problems. The main one is, in the early days, nobody knew what values of C1 and C2 made sense. So Everhard and Kennedy, they say, OK, use these values, you know, a random number between 0 and 2, whatever, and, and that will work. Over the years, some theoretical analysis show that C1 and C2 should be defined in such a way that the addition of these two values doesn't exceed 4. If you exceed 4, the algorithm doesn't work. It diverges. And there is a theoretical explanation of, of why. So some you know, pragmatic people, they say, OK, let's make C1 equals to C2 e equals to 2. The restriction is this. It has to be C1 plus C2 has to be less equal than 4. This has been theoretically proved. The other problem is it has no mutation. So some solutions can never be generated. This also has been proved. 
So you cannot guarantee convergence of PSO unless you add mutation. Now, if you add mutation, there is one more question. What do you mutate? Do you mutate the velocity or do you mutate the position? Which one do you mutate? Most people mutate the velocity. Others, they mutate the position. If you mutate the position, this is more like a genetic algorithm. In the genetic algorithm, you mutate directly the decision variable value. Final issue, if you don't control the velocity, it may happen that some solutions go outside the boundaries of the, of the decision variables. This is a serious problem. And in the early days, that was the reason why many MOPSOs, the multi-objective PSOs, didn't converge, because they didn't constrain the velocity. We learned this back in 2009. And, and now people are using constrained versions. There is a, an equation with which you can constrain the velocity so that the velocity never goes outside the boundaries. Okay? So it's population base, relies on the position of each particle and the velocities. This is supposed to be analogous to the use of, uh, of a crossover operator. It's not the same, of course, but that's what they are. Doesn't use mutation. It allows individuals to benefit from its past experiences because we keep the personal base and the global base. This is something that doesn't exist in evolutionary algorithms. It has been used for discrete and continuous optimization problems. In the book published by, by Everhard and Kennedy, they, they have a binary version of PSO and a continuous version of PSO in the same book, and they run experiments and so on. Uh, a few years after the publication of the book, I think it was in the year 2003, they uh, published a version that uses integer encoding for, for uh, permutations of integers, of PSO. But uh, the most common is to use PSO uh, with uh, real numbers, the continuous version. So to apply PSO to multi-objective optimization, we, of course, need some modifications. So, for example, we need to decide how to select the leaders because the notion of personal best and global best is not a straightforward anymore because it's not based on a single objective function value. But if we use Pareto optimality, we may have several non-dominant solutions. So which one do we use? In the old days, people selected randomly. Then we realized that it should not be done randomly how to retain the non-dominant solutions found during the search. This is easy. We can use an external archive. And how to maintain diversity. PSO doesn't have a density estimator. So a question is, should we add a density estimator, like fitness sharing, clustering, something in the external archive? Normally, uh, MOPSOS have one. OK. The, the very first proposal to extend PSO, this is also an interesting story. Uh, this girl, Jacqueline Moore, she was a master's student in the US under this guy, Richard Chapman. And she wrote a paper in 1999 out of her master's thesis in which she proposed what seems to be the very first extension of PSO to multi-objective optimization problems. The paper, unfortunately, was not very good because there was not a proper validation. She didn't define a density estimator. And she submitted the paper to a special session on evolutionary multi-objective optimization that I was organizing for the Congress on Evolutionary Computation. So the paper got eventually rejected. But since this was the very first attempt to use PSO in multi-objective optimization, I thought that this paper would be important for historical reasons. So I sent Jacqueline an email asking her authorization to put the paper as an unpublished manuscript in the EMO repository. She never replied, so I took that as a yes, and I put the paper in there. <laughs> and the paper has many citations. She should thank me for that. It's, it was a highly cited and published paper for a long time. Then many years later, I found out that they managed to publish this in some small conference in, in the US in the year 2000. This is like an extended abstract. 
So it is the first attempt, but as I said, it doesn't contain a density estimate. Uh, Tapa Ray in 2002, when he was still in Singapore, he proposed a hybrid. This approach combines PSO and evolutionary computation. He uses Pareto dominance for the leaders, crowding for diversity, and this multi-level sieve to handle constraints. The multi-level sieve is an approach that was originally proposed by my colleagues in 96 or 91, something like that, and, uh, and Tapa Brata extended this. Parsopoulos and Brahatis in 2002, they use an aggregating function uh, and, and they try several uh, variations of this for, uh, with PSO for solving multi-objective problems. Later on in 2004, uh, Michael Brahatis, this is the advisor of Parsopoulos, these are people from Greece, they studied a parallel multi-objective version of something they call BEPSO, which is very bizarre because BEPSO is really a PSO version of Vega. You know, by the year 2004, nobody was using Vega anymore. But you will not believe this, but BEPSO has been used by several people in South Africa. They have written PhD thesis on extending BEPSO. I really don't know why, but they, they, they fell in love with this, with this algorithm. In BEPSO, each swarm is evaluated using only one of the objectives, same, same as in Vega, and the information of this objective function is communicated to the other swarms through an exchange of its best experience. So the communication mechanism is different. As, as done in, in Vega, because in Vega you have crossover, and in here you don't have crossover. And then that's me, like, oof, 20 years ago, probably more. I look like in high school in there. Uh, <laughs> this guy, uh, Maximino, Maximino, he was my master's student when I was in, in Jalapa before moving to Mexico City. So in the year 2001, I realized that none of the PSOs that, that existed, that had been used for multi-objective optimization, were properly using Pareto optimality. So I asked this guy, who, who was a very enthusiastic master's student, why don't you develop uh, a multi-objective version based on Pareto optimality? But as an initial step, so that he could get uh, familiarized with, uh, with PSO, I asked him to develop a version of PSO that could solve constraint optimization problems. It's a very simple technique. It was not a penalty technique, something else we were working at that time. That was a long time ago. And, and he came one day to see me with, with this single objective PSO that had great results. You know, he, he could solve a benchmark that was commonly used at that time for constraint problems. All the benchmark he could solve with his PSO. So I was very happy, highly satisfied with this algorithm, although the algorithm was not the thesis, right? The thesis was supposed to be in the multi-objective algorithm. But I told him this is an excellent step to, to start because the single objective algorithm is, is wonderful. Then next thing I know, and this was probably because this guy used to hang around with Gregorio, his laptop crashed. <laughs> and you know, computer scientists, computer scientists don't make backups because that's for the other people, right? We advise other people to do a backup, but we don't do that. It's, it's, it goes against our nature. It's like paying for software. Right? It's, it goes against my principles, so I normally don't do it. Other people can pay for software and give it to me, and that's okay, but I don't want to pay for it. So the thing crashed. Of course, he had no backup of his code, but he said, well, you know, the implementation is not that difficult. I think I can redo the whole thing in a couple of days. And he did, but the algorithm he showed me a week later could never resemble the results of the original implementation, which we believe had a mistake. But uh, anyway, he, he could not get to, to the starting point ever after his computer crash. So we say, okay, let's concentrate on the multi-objective version and, and let's forget about the other one. So, he did an algorithm that was not particularly complicated. It was sort of a straightforward uh, extension. Selection of leaders was done randomly between all the non-dominant solutions. We had an external archive, which was, again, based on the micro GA, based on the Pareto archive, this adapted grid. So it was not meant for high dimensionality. 
And we published this in a conference in the Congress on Evolution and Computation in the year 2002. Year 2002, uh, Maximino had already uh, left Mexico. He, he went to England to get his PhD at uh, the University of Birmingham. And so I had to present the paper in Hawaii at CEC. And it was very funny because in my presentation at the beginning, I gave a short overview of the other uh, multi-objective extensions of PSO that were available. What I didn't know is that the authors of all these other algorithms were in that room. <laughs> Luckily enough, you know, I didn't say, you know, these algorithms are a piece of garbage, which is something that was in my mind, but I, I never say that. So the other guys approached me after the presentation, and we decided to call this algorithm MOPSO because, again, it's the straightforward acronym, right? Multi-objective particles are optimized. It was very funny because there, there were many things, of course, I didn't know. Uh, a couple of years later, and one year later, in 2003, I, I met this lady, Sanas Mostagin, who, uh, who said that she, she was inspired by my work for doing her PhD thesis on, on, on PSO. And she told me, but you know, the name you chose is very funny. I said, why is funny? Because Mopso in German, is, is the name of these uh, dogs that have many wrinkles. Well, this I didn't know. <laughs> I had no idea of this. But I told you, well, Mopso is not a name, it's an acronym, right? So it's not my fault there are dogs called like that in German. How could I know that? I had no idea. So Mopso stay in, in the year 2003, Everhard and Kennedy were editing a special issue on PSO for the IEEE transactions on evolutionary computation. So I decided to submit a paper on the algorithm that Maximino had developed. But we had to run many experiments to do some improvements and all this. And Maximino simply disappeared. So I had to ask the help of Gregorio. Gregorio helped me. He was a great programmer. But again, you know, the code that he developed was on top of the code of Maximino. So when I released this in the public domain, and it's still there, uh, it was a little bit embarrassing. The good thing is the comments of Gregorio are in Spanish. So most people don't understand what they say. But uh, for example, the implementation of the external archive had some weird error. We were asked to try the size of the external archive variating the size from 50 to 250. So we had to try 50, 100, 150, 200, and 250. If you had a, an, an error in the implementation of the external archive, you will expect the error to occur as you increase the, the size. That was not the case. The code of Maximino worked with every size except 50. That's really strange, right? This is anti-natural. Why is that it will not work with the smallest size? With 100, with 150, 200, 250, it worked, but not with 50. So I asked Gregorio, please take a look at what's going on. And, and he put a comment in the code saying, uh, this whole implementation of the archive is a monument to ignorance in, in programming, which was true in a, in a sense. So he rewrote the code, and, and we released a version of the code later on. And this was eventually published in 2004 in the transactions, and it's still a highly cited paper, to my surprise. Gregorio fell in love with PSO. Yes. Of the leaders. Of the leaders. Well, at that time, we, we didn't think it was necessary. And in our experiments, it was not necessary. We had to add mutation. This was necessary. Because some problems like Kurzawa, we could not solve without mutation. Say, uh, say we, we, uh, we select one uh, non-complicated solution for the external Well, it's not supposed to dominate anyone because in the external archive, everybody is non-dominated. The selected non-dominated solution, I would, I, uh, we will check for the current population, not the external archive. Ah, okay, okay. Select one uh, non-dominated solution and we will check for the current population. Yeah, but the problem is everybody who is non-dominated could be a leader. 
So how do you decide which of all, by definition, all non-dominant solutions are equally good? Well, you can do it in many ways, but I'm talking of 2004, right? <laughs> Today, nobody does this randomly. This we did in 2004 because nobody knew how to do it. But I will show you some papers uh, later on of people who studied the selection of leaders, how to do it. But of course, at that time, we didn't know that random was not a good idea. There are many possible ways, and you don't have to compare with the population. All you need is a density estimate. So this PSO didn't have a density estimate. We had mutation, which somehow compensates. But remember, at that time, test problems were very simple. We were only using Kurzawa, Fonseca's problem, very, very simple problem. Today, this MOPSO is no longer competitive. However, the, the interesting thing is I still receive email. Last week, I received an email from people from China, from Iran, who asked me the code to compare results. I said, don't you realize this thing was published in 2004, right? This is no longer a state of the art. No, it's okay. You can cite it as many times as you want. It's just the code <laughs> is not competitive, right? I, I'm happy to give you the code, but if you compare with an algorithm published in 2004, that's clearly not the state of the art. There are much more powerful MOPSOs today than this one. I understand you, you do it as a, an initial step, right? You want to build up a better MOPSO. You can modify this MOPSO. But comparing results with such an old algorithm is, is not a very good idea. You can, of course, do it. And as I told you, I have been very lucky in my life that people have done applications of these algorithms in places that I could never imagine. In 2016, I was in Vancouver at a conference, and a guy told me that in Iran, many people have used MOPSO, this MOPSO we developed in 2004, for problems in electrical industry. And I, I had no idea about this. Sometimes I have found uh, things that I'm not so proud of. In, uh, in 2005, I, I was invited to a conference in Brazil. And during a break, a guy approached me saying that he wanted to get a photograph with me. So yeah, why not? So we got a photograph together. And then he told me he was Russian and that he had used some of my algorithms. So he invited me to attend his talk. And you know, I was curious, what, what, what is this guy doing with my algorithms? So I went to his presentation, and it turns out this guy, he developed a, a guiding system for missiles of MiG planes, a weapon. And he optimized the thing with an algorithm I developed in 2000. I was not so proud of this, but I don't like people to use my algorithms to design weapons. But you, know, you, you have no control of this. The good thing is he eventually invited me to Moscow. So I went to Moscow some years ago in 2015. And he showed me other non-military applications. They optimized some chimneys and, and some uh, nuclear components of a, of a plant. But yeah, sometimes these things happen. You, you don't know. You have no control <laughs> of this. If you release the code, then you don't know what they will do with the code. So Gregorio fell in love with PSO. He abandoned the micro GA2 because that was supposed to be his PhD thesis. So one day he came to see me and he said, I don't want to work on micro GA anymore. I want to do PSO. And I said, well, do whatever you want. You want to do PSO, go ahead. So he started to develop different uh, MOPSOs. For example, this one we published in Gecko 2004. It's a very interesting uh, MOPSO. Uh, in which he uses clustering to divide the population into several subswans. But he does something very interesting, that the particles in one swarm, one cluster, use as a leader a particle from a different swarm. And this works somehow as a density estimate. So this algorithm produced, in the same year, 2004, much better results than the original MOPS. We also have the code available of this one. Then other people started to develop MOPSOs. Jonathan Fielsen in England, he, he developed uh, a MOPSO in which he used uh, Pareto dominance and a secondary population using this uh, data structure called dominated trees. But his archive was unbounded. He, 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 doesn't ha he didn't have a fixed size. 
uh, he also used mutation, but you know, his PSO, so he didn't call it mutation, he called it turbulence, because you, are, you modify the velocity, right? So that's like in a plane, you have turbulence. Uh, Sanaz, this is Sanaz Mostagin, she's from Iran, but she got her PhD in Germany. She proposed a sigma method, which is similar to the idea of compromise programming, and used this in a, in a MOPSO. She also used a turbulence operator, but she applied this on decision variable space. That means on P, not on the velocity. Uh, she also analyzed the influence of epsilon, epsilon dominance in MOPSOS and did a lot of further work on, on, on MOPSOS. Xiaodong Li is another guy who his PhD thesis was on a very obscure area of computer science, got to Australia, didn't know what to work on, and he read one paper we published in 2002, the, this paper on, on the original MOPSO, and he decided to work in that area. So he developed a version of NSGA2 in which he replaces the genetic algorithm by a PSO algorithm. Then he also developed another one using Maximin, which was also very, very interesting. And there were several others. For example, this guy Cho, he developed this multi-species PSO in which each objective function is considered as a species. And there is a communication channel between neighboring swarms for transmitting information. So it's also an interesting idea. Margarita, Margarita is the student I told you yesterday, this one who was a mathematician and, and didn't want to develop what now is Moia D. She ended up working on MOPSO and she developed a very interesting algorithm that it looked very simple, but at that time was the most powerful MOPSO available. And uh, what she did was she used two external archives, one that stores the uh, current leaders and another one that stores the final solutions, same as we do in, in multi-objective evolutionary algorithms. She used epsilon dominance, and, and she had this strategy in which she divided the population into three subpopulations and applied different mutation operators to each of them. So it seemed very simple. She also had a, a selection scheme for leaders that was not random. And these, as I say, work very well. However, Margarita, as I told you, is, is one of these uh, persons who are very smart. Any course you ask her to take, she will get the maximum grades. But she was not very creative. So once she had the algorithm, and we published this in Nemo 2005, I asked her to give it a name. I said, you cannot call it MOPSO because we already have a MOPSO. It has to have you know, a variation of this acronym. So she went thinking on this like one week and came back after one week and she said, okay, I know how I'm going to call it. I'm going to call it O MOPSO. <laughs> okay, and what does the O stand for? And she said, it stands for our. That's not an acronym. <laughs> no, our MOPSO doesn't really count as an acronym. So I, but she could not come up with another name. And me neither. So I say, yeah, what the hell? Let's call it OMOPSO. But it's embarrassing to say what the O means. So we are not going to put the meaning of the O in the paper. And we publish the paper like that. Some years later, uh, Antonio Nebro, the guy who wrote J Metal, is a good friend of mine, he contacted me. And he said that they, they wanted to incorporate OMOPSO in J Metal. So we gave him the code in C, and he converted this to Java and put it. And then one day he sends me an email and says, okay, I have everything ready. I, I have tested the, the implementation. Everything seems to be right. I only have one question. What does the O stand for? <laughs> but then he answered the, the, the question. He said, I discussed this with my team, and we believe that the O stands for optimized. And I say, exactly, that's what it is. <laughs> it's optimized. You, know? you got it. So he put it the optimized MOPSO. That's not the real name, but it's OK with me. It's a lot better than our MOPSO. So other people developed MOPSOs over the years. Uh, Alvarez Benitez with uh, Filsen and, and this guy. They proposed uh, some PSOs based only on, on Pareto dominance to select guys. This was also a very intriguing idea. They presented a demo 2005. They, they presented three techniques, uh, one called rounds, which explicitly promotes diversity in the selection mechanism, another one that promotes convergence, and another one that uses probabilities, your idea, for uh, 
uh, alternating between convergence and diversity. Jürgen, Jürgen Branke, also all these guys, you know, I met when they were very young, which is embarrassing because now we are not so young, none of us. Uh, he, this is a very interesting paper. This paper they presented at PPSN 2006, which was in Iceland. And, uh, well, Iceland is a, it's a very peculiar place. It's the only place I have ever been in my life in which it rains horizontally. It rains like this. So even if you have an umbrella, you're going to get wet because it's so windy. Right? It rains like this. Uh, uh, I was like half an hour distance. My hotel was half an hour distance from the venue. So every morning I had to walk to the venue, 30, 40 minutes. Every day, it rained in these 40 minutes about five times. It would rain and stop, rain and stop. It's crazy weather. You know? And I was thinking, who the hell could live in this place? But yeah, there are only like 100,000 people. Huh? The Vikings, the, the surviving Vikings live in Iceland. So uh, this is a very interesting paper because in this paper, they analyze the influence of the personal best. You see, before these works, People thought you can do it randomly. With Margarita, we didn't do it randomly, but we set a limit on the number of leaders that we could use. But in here, they analyzed several strategies, and they concluded that it was better to uh, memorize all the personal best particles found so far and to use a particular type of strategy that produced the best results in, in a MOPSO. So it was very interesting. Not many, paper, not many people pay attention to this paper, but for me it was a, a very interesting result in, in the area. At that time I was still doing a lot on MOPSUS. Uh, of course, Shin Fusang, you know, he developed Moia D. He had to do a MOPSO D, right? A MOPSO based on decomposition. So he developed this MOPSO D in one year after uh, Moia D. And, uh, MOPSOD uses a turbulence or mutation operator and an archiving strategy based on epsilon dominance. Then I had another student, Juan Carlos. He was a master's student. And, and I asked him to explore the possibility of developing a MOPSO with a very small population size, no more than five individuals. It would be a micro MOPSO. And he did something decent, not so great. We published this in a, in a, in a book chapter. Uh, and this algorithm performed very, uh, a relatively low number of objective function evaluations, only 3,000. Most MOPSOS perform 20,000, 30, 40,000. Uh, it selects the leader and then selects the neighborhood for integrating the swarm and performs a reinitialization process, same as the microgenetic algorithm. You have to reinitialize after a certain number of iterations. Uh, it uses two external archives, one that stores the, solution, that the solutions that the algorithm finds during this search, and another one that stores the final solutions obtained. Uh, there was uh, a MOPSO based on hypervolume contributions proposed by, by some guy, some Indian guy in 2009. Then some Chinese guys proposed the hypervolume, but for pruning the external archives in an epsilon MOPSO, that means a MOPSO based on epsilon dominance. And then a student that I had, a master's student, Ivan, he proposed uh, the use of the hypervolume contribution of, of archive solutions for selecting the, the global and the personal best in a MOPSO. And this is called MOPSO HB. HB stands for hypervolume. And this is a very, uh, very interesting algorithm that works very well. Then Antonio, my, my friend, the guy who developed uh, J-Metal, he contacted me one day and he said he wanted to collaborate with me. And he asked me, do you have some topic in which we could collaborate? He was not an evolution computation guy, but he was very enthusiastic. He came from parallel computing. And I told him, well, you know, I, I have this question for several years. From all the MOPSOs that we have, only one of them, O MOPSO, is able to solve multifrontal problems. None of the other MOPSOs can deal with multifrontal problems. And we don't know why. And nobody has posed the question. I believe it has nothing to do with the leader selection scheme, because the different MOPSOs have different leader selection schemes. So it has to be something else. But I have no idea what it is. 
So he said, okay, fine, let's design an experiment to try to find out. And the answer was so simple. And I was mad at myself for not finding this out. The reason was that the velocity was not constrained. So all we had to do was to constrain the velocity, and we proposed this SMPSO. is the speed constraint multi-objective PSO. This algorithm is based on OMOPSO, but is more powerful. It has the constraint. It's called the constriction factor that is used to constrain the velocity. And this paper that we published in 2009 explains why the other MOPSOs cannot solve multifrontal problems. So it was a very interesting result. The code is available in JMetal, and many people have used it. It's not as popular as, OMO, uh, as the original MOPSO, but uh, this, for several years, was our state-of-the-art MOPSO. So today, there are many other MOPSOs based on everything you can imagine, aggregating functions, decomposition, lexicographic ordering, quantum computing, speciation, coevolution, subpopulation, Pareto ranking, anything you can imagine. I'm supposed to be working on a book on multi-objective metaheuristics in which chapter number one will be on MOPSOs. But, uh, well, I have a delay of like eight years or so on the book. Uh, so I, I convinced Antonio to help me with the pseudocodes, all this part that I was too lazy to do. And now I have the problem that after two years, they finished their, their part and I haven't started mine. So now I'm getting some, some pressure from there that, that I have to finish this. But, so this year I, I'm planning to really work on this book. But there are many, many, many MOPSOs available today. Applications, there are many applications. Almost in, in every area you will find applications of, of MOPSOS in uh, aeronautical engineering, in uh, pattern recognition, vehicle routing, queue management, design of structures, again, pattern recognition, clustering, uh, damage identification, design of controllers, wireless sensor networks, so on. So it has been a very, very popular meta heuristic. In electrical engineering, power systems is, is very, very popular. I don't know why, but it is. So there are several surveys. We wrote one long time ago with Margarita in 2006 in a journal that no longer exists, but the paper is available in my web page. Uh, there is a book that is also very nice by Andrew Sengelberg from South Africa in which he has a whole chapter devoted to MOPSOS. Uh, there is a, another survey that was published in 2008 by Konstantinos Parsopoulos. He's a, he's a very nice guy from Greece. So there has been a lot of work on, on MOPS. OK, so if you don't have any questions, I will move to the next meta heuristic, which is, I think, no, it's not the last one. We still have differential evolution, artificial immune systems. Any questions so far on, on MOPSOS or any of the other uh, meta heuristics? If you want source code, uh, in the break somebody was asking me about that, of MOPSOS in the EMO repository you will find. Also JMetal, there is source code. Multi-objective simulated annealing, the only source code I know is AMOSA by Sangamitra, is the only one I know is available. Taboo search, I know that we're of any. But in this book that I am supposed to be working on, we are going to have a chapter on multi-objective taboo search. So as soon as we get to that chapter, the code will be available. Because Antonio is implementing that, not me. So there will be some code available in JMetal. He's putting everything in JMetal. Uh, we will also have code of multi-objective simulated annealing, multi-objective artificial immune systems, all the heuristics I have described, and a couple of other heuristics. So they will, they will come. OK. Artificial immune systems. Uh, you are probably aware of the wonders of our immune system. The immune system uh, has evolved. It's part of uh, the tools we have from evolution. And, and it's actually quite intriguing and, and very interesting. Because the immune system is designed to protect us from, from diseases, but it has evolved into a very complex system of defense of our organism. Uh, 
for example, uh, one of the features of the immune system that makes it so peculiar is, I don't know if you are aware that all over the world, uh, life expectancy varies. There, there is kind of a big variation, like in Africa, is, we have the lowest, and I think in Japan is the highest. But in general, life expectancy is always higher for women than for men. For example, in Mexico, life expectancy is, I believe, 74 for women and about 70 for men. So one day, you know, scientists, we, we pose questions, right? So one day I was asking myself, why is that women live longer than men or are expected to live longer? And a friend of mine told me, well, because they make our life miserable. Well, this I, I thought, yeah, this I know, but I don't think this is the reason, right? This may be true, but I, I don't believe that is the reason. There is a biological reason. The reason is that women have a much more sophisticated immune system because nature designed them to procreate, to have children. So their immune systems not only have to protect them, it has to protect the child. Because this immune system is more evolved than our immune system, they are expected to live longer. So nature made them stronger than us in that sense. So that's very interesting. And there are many other aspects, you know, during uh, uh, evolution of humankind, uh, normally many behaviors that we see now in modern women Modern men are patterned after the behaviors we, we had when we were hiding in, in, in some caverns and, and hiding away from animals. Uh, for example, uh, the British, the British, they always do very interesting studies, totally useless, but, but very funny. Uh, one study they did some years ago was to try to explain, and this I don't know in India, but in, in the Western world, this is very common. No man likes to go with a woman shopping because women have an inhuman resistance to this they can spend 20 hours shopping no stop i have never met a man who can resist more than 10 minutes shopping it's, we have no resistance to this okay so some british scientists trying to find a scientific explanation for this and here is the explanation it's very interesting they say that when we were in caves Men went out to find food. Sometimes they didn't come back. They were eaten by an animal, killed, whatever. You know, that was okay. You know. It was affordable to lose them. But women had to stay in the cave with the children. They were not allowed to go outside. So they had absolutely nothing to do in the cave. So what they did was, okay, look, this stone is out of place. So I'm going to move it here. So they evolved in a different direction. They focus their attention in things that are completely irrelevant to men because we were busy, you know, trying to kill something to, to have something to eat. So we didn't pay attention to the details. This actually, I, I, I live on my own when I was a student in the U.S. When I went to the U.S., that was the first time in my life I live away from my house. So when I was in my house, my mother provided everything. She had a very bad temper, but other than that, you know, I, it went very well. So I went to a supermarket the first time. And I got tuna. And I got it at a very low price, and I had no idea why. The, the reason was this tuna was meant for cats, not for humans. But this I didn't realize until I was at home. And I tried to cook the thing. I said, why does it have a cat in the, in the can, right? This didn't look natural. So I didn't pay attention. However, my wife, she goes to the supermarket to buy tuna. And she looks at different brands. She checks how many grams each can has, and with a calculator, ask me to estimate the price per gram. You know, this for me makes absolutely no sense. For me, the only decision that makes sense is that it's a tuna that humans can eat. That's all I care about. I don't care what's the price per gram. It doesn't make any difference to me. So according to the British, the reason is this. We evolved in different directions. Right? We were busy killing ourselves outside. And violence is very interesting. It's a component of evolution. Many evolutionists believe that we evolved into what we are now because of violence. Because men 
found out that he didn't have to be stronger. He had to develop tools. Tools became weapons. And then you could kill a stronger men or a stronger animals without being stronger yourself. That was very interesting. So evolution took a different direction. So uh, at Simvestad, my institution, there are some biologists who is, they are studying what they call the innate immune system. The innate immune system is the immune system of, of, a, of a baby. And, and it's very interesting because it has properties, some of which apparently get lost when we grow. When we grow. Uh, but uh, it's, it's a fascinating thing to study the immune system. So the main task of the immune system is to recognize all these cells within our body. And the immune system has some level of intelligence because it can distinguish between its own cells and external cells. These external cells are the disease. When we get ill, in our blood, we get these cells called antigens. The antigen is the disease. So our organism responds to these antigens. So the immune system, once it identifies these external cells, develops a defense mechanism against them. It produces some cells called antibodies. So it's very, very interesting. So once the antigen enters our, uh, it's basically the blood, it ent they enter through the blood, our immune system launches a specific response. We have these specialized B cells that interact with the uh, so-called T cells to start generating antibodies. So the antibodies are specific to a certain type of antigen. So this is like, you can see this as pieces of a puzzle. I will put this in 2D, but in, uh, in real life they are 3D, 3D pieces. So what the immune system does is it produces antibodies with certain shapes. And then we have the antigen also with a certain shape. So from the different uh, antibodies that are produced by the immune system, they see which one produces the best match with respect to the antigen. The one, it produces, for example, 10 different antibodies. From those, let's say this is the one that has the best match. It's not a perfect match, but it's close enough. So this one is mutated. They, it does something that is called hypermutation. It's mutation at a very high rate. And mutation modifies the shape of this so that it can fit with this part, with the antigen. Once it fits, it nullifies the antigen and the antigen dies. And when it dies, we eliminate these cells. That's my grandmother used to say, when you are ill, if you start sweating, that means you are going to get better soon. And it's true to a certain extent because we expel these, these uh, cells through urinating or sweating. It's, 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 a, it's a fluid. So that's the antigen death. But also the antibodies are eliminated. However, something very interesting is that once these, uh, these antibodies are eliminated, a small portion of them are kept in our body. The immune system keeps them. And this is called the secondary response. So the second time the same antigen invades our body, the first line of defense are these antibodies that many years ago defended our, our system. That's the principle of vaccines. In a vaccine, what they do is they inject the antigen to force the immune system to develop the, the antibodies. So we will never get ill. But there are other interesting examples. For example, perhaps some of you have the same situation as myself. I was born very close to the coast in the south of Mexico. And in the place where I was born, there were many mosquitoes. You know, these small, really upsetting mosquitoes. I was very hot. You know, it, it was a place that was 10 meters below sea level. 
So we had temperatures of 40 degrees and so on. So people will normally take a nap in the afternoon, and you could see this big cloud of mosquitoes. It looked black. You know, they were attacking people. But what happened is we got so many mosquito bites that our immune system developed antibodies to protect us. So after those years, and, and I moved when I was five to, to a, a bigger city, but the antibodies I developed when I was a child have been sufficient for me so that the rest of my life, whenever a mosquito bites me, I don't develop the typical rushes or irritations in the skin because I have the antibodies in my, in my body. Although for many years I didn't use them because I live in Mexico City, which is 2,000 meter, meters above sea level, so there are rarely mosquitoes in there. But whenever I go to a place where there are mosquitoes, like here there are some mosquitoes, they bite me and it's okay because I, I don't get a, an allergic reaction because I still have these antibodies in, in, inside me. So it's very interesting because then we can say the immune system has memory. It remembers what attack the body before and it knows how to respond. So the question is, can we develop a system, a computational system, based on our immune system? And the answer is, of course we can. So computationally speaking, the immune system is smart, is highly parallel, and is able to learn and to recover whatever it has learned. So it has memory. So Bersini and Varela, oh, thanks, were the first to apply algorithms based on immune systems to solve problems in the early 1990s. In fact, I think Varela has already died. Uh, and then Stephanie Forrest and Alan Perelson also did some pioneering work in an area that today is known as computational immun immunology, which is basically to develop computational models of the Im immune system. There are, of course, also mathematical models that have not become computational models. So Forrest, for example, used genetic algorithms to study the capabilities of a binary artificial immune system to recognize patterns. Today, people normally consider three main models of uh, artificial immune systems uh, for uh, solving problems. There are more than three. These are the three main ones. Today, some people use also some, some, something called danger theory and, and uh, something called the Red Queen effect. But I won't get into that. I, I don't do much of immune systems anymore. And nobody does. This is a, it's an area that is not very popular. So the three main ones are immune network theory, negative selection, and clonal selection. So if we want to extend artificial immune system to multi-objective problems, Basically, we have to decide how to influence the propagation of antibodies. Because in the single objective artificial immune system, we have something called affinity function, which will, this is the equivalent to the fitness function. And the affinity function tells me how should I produce antibodies based on the antigens. So this we have to do multi-objective. And we need to have a density estimator because Artificial immune systems don't have, of course, a density estimate. It's also useful to have a secondary population. So uh, back in 93, there were people like Smith. He was working with uh, Stephanie Forrest. He showed, for example, that fitness sharing could emerge from emulating an immune system in a computer. This was a very interesting experiment. They used something called negative selection. In negative selection, you choose the opposite of what you have. For example, you measure a distance, and instead of minimizing the distance, you maximize the distance. You do the opposite. So this was an interesting paper published in ICGA in 93. And other people use the same to handle constraints. For example, Pravat Ayela. Also, there were hybrids with a multi-objective evolutionary algorithm with this guy, Kurapati. And we developed also a parallel version of this with Narelli, who was my PhD student back in 2004. However, historically, we consider that the first actual uh, use of an artificial immune system, system to solve 
a multi-objective problem was done by you and Ajela in 99. This is a guy from uh, aeronautical engineering. They use a very simple approach. It's a linear aggregating function. And, uh, and they use a genetic algorithm. And they embed the, the immune system inside the genetic algorithm. So this is an algorithm that has an inner loop. In the inner loop, they run the artificial immune system that uses a humming distance to uh, try to make solutions that are infeasible. They try to make them feasible by minimizing the humming distance between an infeasible and a feasible solution. It's a very strange approach, but it works. We, we implemented this, we tried, and it, it does work. There were many other proposals. The Chinese have worked a lot on this. They developed uh, look, developed this multi-objective immune algorithm, which is very complex. It has lots of mechanisms. The decision variables are divided in two parts, a heavy string and a light string. And, and they use different uh, mutation rates. Uh, the antigens are the objective function values and the constraints that we, that we have. And affinity is measured in such a way that the best antibodies are the feasible non-dominant solutions. So these are the solutions we try to replicate. Uh, they also use something called a germinal center in which the non-dominant solutions are cloned. Cloning is a, is a function that exists in the natural immune systems, and they are also hypermutated. Hypermutation is only applied to one portion of the stream. So it is a very elaborate idea. Felipe Campello, he proposed the multi-objective clonal selection algorithm, MOXA, which combines ideas of clonal G. Clonal G is sort of the standard artificial immune system. It was presented in the book by Leandro de Castro in 2002. The code, uh, well, the, uh, the pseudocode is available in the book. And there was another version called OpAnet. This is a, a, an immune network, but it's very similar to clonal G. MOXA uses real numbers encoding, non-dominant sorting, cloning, maturation, which is mutation, and replacement based on, on non-dominant sorting. And it also uses niching. This is the density estimator. So in this case, the worst solutions, those that were not selected for cloning, are eliminated, and then they are regenerated in a, in a random way. <laughs> and it also adopts a, an external archive to store the non-dominant solutions produced during this search. Uh, Jerzy Baliki, he extended the adaptive multicriteria evolutionary algorithm with taboo mutation and incorporated a constraint handling mechanism based on an artificial immune system. He actually used one that we developed back in 2004. He just modified the, the way of using the humming distance between the antigens and the antibodies. In this case, antibodies which are closest from the antigens and are non-dominated are selected as are the winners. We, we don't do the ant in, in our approach. And he used this to solve a task assignment problem. With uh, Narelli, we developed what is considered the first multi-objective artificial immune system based on Pareto dominance. This was originally presented in 2002 in a conference called ICARIS. ICARIS used to be the only specialized conference on artificial immune systems, but now it's, it's not being held anymore. I think the last time ICARIS took place was in the year 2012. And after that, uh, well, the community is very, very small. And also these guys are very, uh, it's a very strange community. They, they have a very strange behavior. It's not a very friendly community. So MISA uses uh, an external archive, which uses the adaptive grid. And the antibodies, in this case, are the decision variables. And there is no population of antigens. Instead of that, we use Pareto dominance and feasibility to identify the best solutions. And these solutions are cloned and hypermutated. The hypermutation rate is proportional to the affinity of each antibody. <laughs> And we also use a non-uniform mutation operator, which is applied to the antibodies, which are not so good, not the best. Uh, at the beginning, mutation is used with a high probability, and then we decrease the probability over time. And this is the paper in which we introduce inverted generational distance. It's the same paper. 
There are many other proposals of artificial immune system. For example, Vincenzo Cutello in 2005 extended the Pareto archive uh, with a different representation for a bioinformatics problem. This is a protein structure prediction problem. And he used immune-inspired operators. So he uses these three steps, a clonal expansion phase, an affinity maturation phase. This is the mutation, basically, and an evaluation phase, and then a selection phase. This was presented at the EVO workshops. The EVO workshops are a, a very prestigious event in evolution and computation. It, it always takes place in Europe. Li Chen Yao, he proposed the immune dominance clonal multi-objective algorithm, which is based on clonal selection and adopts uh, Pareto dominance. In this case, the antigens are the objective functions and the constraints that we must satisfy, and the antibodies are the candidate solutions. This is normally the, the, what we do in, in artificial immune systems. And then the affinity, which, I, as I say, this is the equivalent to the fitness function, is based on the objective function values and the feasibility of the candidate solution. Again, they use Hamming distances. So most of these multi-objective multi artificial immune systems operate with binary encoding, most of them. There are very few that use real numbers. In this case, they use this immune differential degree, which is a value that denotes the relative distribution of non-dominant solutions in, in the population. So this is similar to fitness share. Lu proposed the immune forgetting multi-objective optimization algorithm, the if more, which uses a fitness assignment scheme of the SPA, the, the algorithm by Sisler, a clonal selection operator, and this weird immune forgetting operator. So the clonal selection operator implements clonal proliferation, affinity maturation. Remember, maturation means mutation, and clonal selection on the antibody population. Fabio, Fabio Freshi, actually this guy, he wrote his PhD thesis on, on, on an artificial immune system for multi-objective optimization. It's called the vector artificial immune system. It's based on immune networks, and it assigns fitness using the strength value of the strength Pareto evolutionary algorithm. This is the same as MOGA's ranking. So after assigning fitness to an initially randomly population, then it clones each solution and mutates those solutions. Then it applies a Pareto-based selection, and non-dominant solutions are stored in an external memory. Mao uh, Guogong, this guy, he has done a lot on, on artificial immune systems. He proposed the non-dominated neighbor immune algorithm, NNIA, which adopts uh, a novel non-dominated neighborhood-based selection, an immune-inspired operator, two heuristic search operators, and elitists. Selection in this case uh, only selects minority, isolated, non-dominated individuals in, in the populations. These individuals are cloned, proportional to the crowding distance they, they have. Uh, so it adopts basically operators from uh, NSGA2 and operators from clonal, clonal selection. It's an interesting approach, and it was published in a top journal in evolutionary computation. Uh, we have Nika, proposed by Chang. Uh, this uh, is based also, most of these algorithms are based on clonal selection. So in this case, antibodies uh, are divided into dominated and non-dominated. <coughs> then uh, he clones solutions. This uh, full cloning rate is applied instead of having cloning rates based on affinity. So everybody's cloned at the same rate. Uh, clonal selection in ba is based on Pareto dominance. And uh, the, uh, the population size is set within certain bounds. And in here, I forgot to put the name of the journal. I don't remember. I think this was uh, uh, published in some artificial intelligence journal. And this was the last work I did on, on multi-objective artificial immune system. Back in 2012, this guy, Thomas Pierrard, is a French guy. He, there was a, an international master's program in operations research from the University of Nantes. And they sent me this guy six months to Mexico to write his master's thesis. And he developed this algorithm, which is based on hypervolume. 
And this we published in the last ICARIS conference in 2012. This, this took place in Taormina. It's a beautiful place in Italy, in, uh, in Sicily. So in this case, the antigens are considered to be good solutions and antibodies are bad solutions. So we have two sets and we have two new subpopulations. Antigens are cloned and uh, we use mutation. If we only have one rank, that will be the first rank in non-dominated sorting, then can candidates to be cloned are selected from individuals that contribute the most to, uh, to maximize the hypervolume. Otherwise, we select successive ranks and hypervolume is applied to the last of these ranks. So it's similar to SMS IMOA. The clones and the best antigens found are merged and the size of the main population is maintained by discarding individuals that contribute the least in maximizing the hypervolume. This is the only multi-objective artificial immune system based on hypervolume. Uh, one more, uh, Xiao, he, uh, they propose the immune dominance selection multi-objective optimization algorithm, the it's more that this is inspired on the mechanism that controls how the B cells and the T cells differentiate, recombine, and mutate to produce the, uh, the antibodies. And here they say the antigens, but should be antibodies. So they promote two populations that co-evolve uh, through an immune selection operator. And uh, they use other operators in, inspired on, on, on the natural cloning of the immune system. And uh, one of the aims of this approach is to decrease the number of what we call dominance resistant solutions. These are solutions that emerge when we are solving problems with many objectives. With many objectives, there are solutions that are called dominance resistant. I didn't get into that because it's a more complicated topic, but this is meant, and you can see this is very recent, this is meant for many objective optimization. So applications, we have quite a few applications of multi-objective artificial immune systems. It's not as popular as the other uh, meta heuristics we have seen, but still people have used them for computer networks, for circuits, for control, for uh, community detection in social networks, portfolio selection, and so on. If you want to know more, we wrote a survey with Fabio Freschi some years ago, back in 2009. Felipe Campello also has a nice uh, review published in IMO 2007. So I don't know if you have any, any questions, because I'm about to stop, because we will continue tomorrow with differential evolution. I think it's the last one we are missing.